Broadcasting from the Unshackled Studios in Melbourne, this is Will's Front, brought to you by theunshackled.net. Now here's Tim Wills. Dr. Elizabeth Taylor was previously the Director of Research at the Australian Christian Lobby based in Canberra. Much of her published research with them was about the, the Safe Schools program, gender ideology and the queer revolution, and has also had published research on pornography. Uh, if you've watched any of her speeches or read any of her research, it is thorough, reasoned, and her conclusions measured. Elizabeth, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thanks, Jim. Nice to have you. Nice to have you to have me. Now, the internet has been an overall social good over the past 25 years. I mean, I'm able to talk to you at the moment through the, the, the power of the internet and get this information out, but uh, its uh, negative uh, impacts uh, cannot be uh, underestimated or, or hidden, uh, particularly uh, the explosion in easy accessibility of uh, pornography, prostitution services and sexualized content uh, everywhere. It's been around for most of, of human history, uh, but in my opinion, it's moderate accessibility before the, the digital revolution when uh, or particularly young men had to seek it out through magazines or VHS tapes that was a had a negligible negative impact on uh, sexual relations compared with today. Yep, I would agree with that absolutely, and particularly the it's not just technology; it's the fact that now it's free, so you don't have to pay for it. Yes, exactly, and uh, it's ac accessible despite all the 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 best. Uh, well, when I say best intentions, the uh, uh, the well, efforts made by ISPs and various sites to 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 limit access, particularly to to to, to minors, uh, has uh, proven to be extremely foolproof. Well, I, I think there's been mixed success, hasn't there, in in trying to limit it. In, in the UK, they had ISP blockers. I understand that those were um, circumvented by some particularly tech savvy youngsters so you can you can make efforts to limit it i definitely think that's worthwhile doing but uh trying to block it off completely is is a really difficult thing for one thing you're up against a, an industry that is very keen to deliver its product to a young audience um and that's one of the reasons why they started delivering free content because they could get to a young audience before people had credit cards and they realized they can create a market for their product so that young people, by the time they have finances of their own, then they're already hooked on, on pornography. And governments only have limited resources and also limited knowledge. You just said that it's easy for tech-savvy people to circ circumvent these government filters, uh, but there's also the prioritising, the obviously the, 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 the saddest and most uh, evil aspect of the uh, the internet has been the rise of child exploitation material, particularly in, in third world countries. And if there, if uh, governments are going to take action on uh, uh, online pornography, best to focus on, on that uh, horrific uh, uh, non-consensual material. Yeah, I, well, I, I think governments should take action, whatever action they can to limit this sort of traffic. A lot of it, of the sort of non-consensual stuff well, how much of it is consensual anyway? I think a lot of the consensual stuff is, it, 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 there's an illusion of consent. So I'm, I'm not going to say that even the, the stuff that is marketed as consensual is somehow ethical or, or, or right, because that's certainly not the case and uh, highly questionable. But the sort of stuff that you're talking about that is definitely illegal, a lot of that is passing on the dark web, which is very, very hard to regulate. So we're really talking about two different things. One of them is um, the, the illegal stuff, which because it's uh, so prolific, then feeds into regular culture. And I think regular culture is where government legislation can make a big difference. For example, families at the moment that want to prevent their children accessing pornography at home need to take their own steps to filter their home network 
and to monitor their children's devices, for example, when they leave the home. Well, that's expensive and it takes effort. And all that it, all that's required is for one slip up and then suddenly your child is exposed to some really horrendous stuff that's just at their fingertips and they can search on very innocent sounding words on Google and come up with images which are really horrific. And if it's not, of course, you can make all the efforts to protect your own children and then find that they've seen it on somebody else's device on the school bus or at the skate park or wherever they happen to be. So um, the there is a problem at the moment that all of the efforts to stop pornography are happening right at the, at the um, family level. And that's sometimes parents are, are not aware of the problems and it requires effort and money and, and a conscientious vigilance to stop that sort of thing coming through into your household. And I think that that setting is wrong because um, it, it offends the user pays principle, doesn't it? Normally, if you don't want to receive a product, you shouldn't have to pay to not receive the product. You um, This way, you, you know, you get pornography into your home unless you pay to block it and, and you know, take efforts to block it. And that's not the way it should be. So, for example, I, I use the analogy that it's a bit like saying, look, we're just going to fill the whole world with cigarette smoke. And if you don't choose to breathe cigarette smoke, then you need to buy an oxygen tank. And I think that that's, you know, not not the right way for, for people to, to be. So we, we should... Uh, as far as possible, um, make sure that the, um, you know, online online um, activity is safe for children because children need to be uh, able to use um, their computers and to search freely on the internet and to know that they're not going to stumble into horrendous stuff. And also um, that then feeds into culture, into billboard advertising, outdoor advertising, that sort of thing as well. So, yes, I, I think there's a lot that the government can do. I'm very pleased to see that they're looking at it it's a long, they're a long way behind where the UK is, for example. So even if even if government measures are circumvented by some tech savvy youths, I still think it's worth protecting the ones who mostly stumble on this kind of stuff by accident, who are not curious, who are not tech savvy, they're not looking for it, but they just happen to type in an innocent search and come up with some really quite shocking stuff. It's not just the the impact on on children that the the easy accessibility of pornography has. It also uh, distorts and damages uh, adult sexual relations, particularly. Yeah. Uh, the, uh, often, uh, often adults seek out such content willingly, but then as a sexual pornography addiction grows, they 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 need to feed their addiction with often more violence and uh, fetish uh, pornography. And then obviously a lot of, uh, with modern technology as well, there's a lot of video editing and, and Photoshopping, distorting uh, re uh, real life sex and well, uh, human bodies. And uh, this is both in regard to con uh, consent and uh, sexual uh, dysfunction. Um, there's a, a famous quote from, from South Park. It's quite rude, but I hope you don't mind me uh, saying it to you because I think it sums this up quite well. Uh, Randy Marsh, who stands dad, says, uh, once you jack off to Japanese girls puking in each other's mouths, you can't exactly go back to Playboy, which is a crude way to basically <laughs> talk, talk about the profile <laughs> of pornographic addiction. Yeah, absolutely. And that was always there. I was really interested uh, reading Martin Amos, who's a you know British writer, uh, did a an in depth research article on the pornography industry, and this was in this was he was still looking at these things on videos on on VHS. So it was before broadband, and uh, that was one of his comments was that it expands your tastes. In he was he was quoting I can't remember who it was, but he was quoting someone who said the problem with watching porn is that you might never want to do anything else other than watch porn, and he said his his problem was not that he. Um, wouldn't want to do anything else. He was worried that he might like it. Some of this weird stuff that he was looking at. What if you suddenly discovered within yourself, within the darkest part of your soul, some sort of nasty, you know, that you actually responded to some some fairly hor horrifying things. And this is exactly what broadband has now, um, you know, his darkest fears have been realised by broadband because, of course, things become boring after a while. So just like YouTube will suggest things that you might like to watch next, Pornhub will suggest things that you might like to watch next. And so 
they're very sophisticated, these algorithms now at working out where you are and where you might want to go and, and, you know, tracking your history and expanding your sexual tastes. And that's exactly what's happening. So just back to your point about how it's changing sexual culture, it was, um, and I think it's it's changing sexual culture, the, the technology's uh, getting away from us in a way so that people are not keeping up with the changes that are happening and, and are not aware of how technology is shaping culture. But even before I was researching at the ACL, and um, you know, these have always these have always been issues that interested me. And a friend of mine who was significantly younger than me, she was married, but she had a lot of she was in her early thirties at the time, and this would have been five six years ago. She had a lot of friends who were single and still in the the uh, what is it Tinder uh, culture. So they were they were online dating apps. This sort of thing was was I suppose relatively new. And she said that she was shocked um, because a lot of them were finding, you know, they'd meet up with a guy. This is hookup culture, right? So they're going back to bed on the first date. They don't know these people very well. And these women were finding that they were being strangled, not, not just one of them. She had had several friends that this had happened to. And she said the, I mean, the sensible ones got up and walked out and decided never to see that guy again. But she was concerned that uh, the, some of them were beginning to accept that this was just part of a sexually active lifestyle. If you wanted to be sexually active, you just had to put up with being strangled. And that was the thing that really bothered her, that these women were sort of going, oh, well, you know, there, there you go. And I was so shocked by that. And I thought that can't possibly be happening. That hasn't you know, I've, I've been married for a great many years, but I, I can't imagine that sexual culture is really so barbaric. So I mentioned it to the next young woman that I knew. She was in her early 30s, um, a feminist activist, professional, you know, tertiary educated, upwardly mobile, completely together, confident, not one of nature's victims anyway, you would think. And I mentioned this to her. I said, have you heard about this? This seems shocking to me. And there was this awkward pause, and then she said, "Well, I've, I've been strangled." It was—it's not the sort of thing that people bring up in polite conversation generally. So, I was gobsmacked. And then she told me the circumstances. You know, it was someone that she didn't know well, but she had reason to trust that they had good character. And then she found herself being strangled and froze, and then you know, sort of slithered out of bed and went to have a shower. And when she got back. She was shocked because he was offended at her uh, for saying, and, and he said, well, that was a big turn off. Like you didn't respond. You didn't do your part. And she was shocked that there was such a mismatch of their expectations and that he had expected her to respond positively and was offended that she hadn't because she was saying, well, surely that's an unusual expectation. You know, why would you, why would you assume someone would respond positively to being strangled. And she reasoned that there must be something going on in male culture to, um, you know, some sort of message that men were being given that she, that women were completely unaware of. Anyway, so a couple of years later when I, oh, it got worse actually, because then she said a few months later, she had reason to go to the physiotherapist and the physiotherapist touched her neck and she flinched and the, her reaction was so strong. She was slightly embarrassed by it because she hadn't anticipated that she would have such a strong emotional reaction to being touched on the neck. And uh, she apologized to the physiotherapist and said, oh, I'm, I'm sorry. And she, she explained why she reacted that way. And the physiotherapist said, I have a lot of women coming in who don't like their necks being touched, who respond similarly when their necks are touched. And it's because this is going on. This is almost a routine part of, of culture. So when I finally, when I was researching pornography, and I did include her um, her story in my report with her permission, um, and I, I emailed her and said, hey, do you remember how you were saying there's something weird going on in male culture? Well, it's gonzo porn. And she wrote back saying, well, who knew? <laughs> women are not being told that these are the narratives that are being fed to young men and they're false narratives they're really dehumanizing uh, ho horrible i mean this, this is really a, a barbarous thing that's happening to sexual culture anyway so so that was her story and i put that story in the report that i wrote about pornography and one of the reviewers who was from america wrote back almost challenging me and saying, is that really your story? Because I've heard that story. <laughs> and I thought, oh, that's so funny. I mean, it's, it's, it's funny, but it's horrible because it shows that this is actually happening all around the world and there is one common source and it is pornography. 
I'd like to think that it's not as common as as uh, these encounters that uh, you've heard and others have heard from uh, women are, but it's certainly a concerning and uh, alarming uh, trend that some men are getting this idea that uh, this is uh, th this is what modern sexual relations is because uh, before you mentioned this I was going I was going to say that a lot of uh, a lot of uh, you, you would say both men and women they uh, they don't want that sort of uh, uh, want to imitate that sort of things that is, that is in that uh, gonzo horn as well and so there's the as as you said there's these mismatch there and I also like to think that I know there's plenty of, of Tinder horror stories that have uh, that, that are in the media and that have ended up in the in the courts. Uh, but I also like to think that that's not too common as well. Based on well, my own experience, I don't know any men who would think it would be okay to uh, strangle a woman for sexual pleasure. Uh, even if they they thought it, they, they thought that she she wanted it or wanted to do weird things on a Tinder date, so I do know some men who who use Tinder. How would how do you know though? And this is one of the things that I found it very shocking. How, how do you know if this is in people's experience or not, unless you actually ask the question? And when you do ask the question, then I, I, I was I was very shocked to hear it coming from more than one one place. And can I tell you, it's not just being promoted to men because then I looked at, I looked at it you know oh let's let's see what they say about strangling in women's health there's a magazine called women's health that's all of, I've got these long articles about how you might like to try it really uh, but be really careful because it's crazy dangerous and you can kill someone really easily right so and this is a magazine called women's health that's advocating this for women I was shocked but you know it, it's so it's I don't think it's coming from men and I certainly don't want to blame men for it I actually think what we need to understand is that there is a, a very significant industry that is trying to change sexual culture and to expand people's tastes and that has strong commercial interests in doing so. Oh, I, I don't doubt that there's that interest well. But uh, if, if I just bring it back to, to what I was, was saying before, I mean, uh, I, I'm, a, I'm a man, you're a woman, and uh, where, uh, a lot of the time when uh, men are together, like talking about... Thing, uh, things particularly women and, and drinking, but as uh, Trump famously called it, locker room talk. That's when sort of the sort of loose language can can come out. And I just want to say that has never come up in so-called locker room talk. Uh, it's well uh, discussions that I've been a part of. Good. Uh, oh well, I'm, I'm pleased you have nice friends. Mm. Now, obviously, with the, the COVID pandemic and associated lockdowns of the past year, a dating, going out on a, on a date has been impossible for a, a lot of people. And uh, it, uh, this is where, well, people stuck at home, if they've got no, no job, nothing, nothing to do, some will, will occupy themselves with pornography. And uh, I think we saw in the early days of the, the, the pandemic, uh, Pornhub, Offering free access as part of their to what does it help people through the the the, the pandemic and there's there, there's countless negative health aspects to these associated lockdowns and definitely the well is isolation uh, particularly if you're a, a single person uh, that it's it's going to be even more difficult for for some who've been cooped up for for six months, not having had any sort of dating, let alone uh, actual uh, physical sexual int intimacy, to re-enter that world. Hmm. Yep. I. Yep. I agree. So is that something you fear that uh, going forward? Because the, we, we've even had uh, some public health agencies say, say things that, what is it? I, I, even the New South Wales Health Agency said that uh, self-love is, is safer. I think there was the, one of the Canadian public health officers said, uh, oh, if you're going to have sex with even your partner, do it so you're not facing each other really bizarre 
health health, health advice. Yes, yes. I actually don't know how you how you deliver health advice in that space, including including for sex workers and this sort of thing. How do how do you how do you manage that safely when you're not supposed to be within a one point five meters of each other? That's uh, yeah, the mind boggles really. Is this something that you feel that like in your research you might examine going forward once we're eventually Victoria is in another lockdown? Uh, but is this something that in your future research, you might examine just how much the well, the, the the pornography industry, porn consumption, has exploded during this this pandemic. Oh, it certainly would be an interesting thing to to look at. I, I have no plans to. In, I really don't want to go back to investigating pornography. Um, it wasn't my favourite thing, I have to say. I, you know, it was, it was rather a, a, a gruesome task. Um, but certainly pornography thrives on isolation and I think it compounds people's isolation. So it, it can be um, it, it can be a problem. I mean, pornography is the recourse of, of lonely people, not not only, but, you know, cert certainly that's uh, one of the major markets. And so are they helping people or are they preying on people? Are they, you know, boosting their own industry? I, I think it's a reprehensible industry. So obviously wherever they're benefiting their own market share, then uh, then I think they're hurting people. But, um, yeah, on, on, for adults, we're really talking about you're going to have to manage that yourself. And I think that one of the things that helps people is to understand uh, the effects that pornography can have on you, That uh, that it's not all... If, you know, from a health point of view and from a disease point of view, fine, self-love, as they call it, might be safer. But um, it, from a psychological point of view and a social point of view, it probably isn't. It, it's not harm-free anyway, I would put it that way. Uh, well, you are known as the the, the researcher who, who dives into those uh, uh, dark, uh, sinister parts of our culture. Uh, you... you, you dive deep into all the safe schools literature and all the the, the cultural Marxist uh, arguments behind it and also uh, a gender ideology as well. So you, you, you must you must need to have a, what is it, I say a pretty, well, not so much uh, a thick skin, but not be shocked easily to, to dive into all that stuff so you can present <laughs> it in a... A, a, a more concise way you you dive into this stuff so others don't have to as it's termed yeah 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 I, well when I was doing the, the porn report I mean I, I think a lot of people would shy away from it because it's, it's so dark actually a lot of it is very dark and it takes you to some very nasty places <laughs> but on the other hand I think this is people's lives this is affecting the way people live and it's really lacking in compassion if we just cover it over with a blanket or I'm not going to go there, I'm going to, you know, protect myself. I just think, well, um, if people are waiting around in sewage, let's investigate the problem and, and try and work out how we can help that problem rather than just saying, oh, that smells, I won't go near it. Let's talk about some proposed solutions. So the, the, the Parliamentary Standing Committee on Social Policy and Legal Affairs uh, uh, this week uh, released a report. Uh, it's chaired by Liberal uh, MP Andrew Wallace proposing age verification for uh, online uh, pornography. Now, we, we, we've we spoken about briefly the, the, the ISP filters, uh, things like this have been trialled in the, the, U, the UK. Is you, you've said it's worth a worth a try, but then there is also the, the the online privacy advocates who well, there's already a lot of uh, paranoia about uh, online online tracking, particularly in the the, the COVID uh, pandemic with with all the the QR check ins and and that. Uh, certainly, a lot of people don't want to put their identity verification into accessing such material because, well, hackers and people can circumvent that and it can be very embarrassing for them, rightly or wrongly. Fine. No, I, I can understand um, why people would be concerned about their viewing history becoming public or being blackmailed or any of those sorts of things. But I think I don't believe that technology that it's impossible for technology to solve these problems. Um, 
in France, for example, and this 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 is a different kind of privacy invasion, perhaps, but it takes us back to the old days when uh, in, in France you can go to the shop and buy tokens, for example. So you don't have to put all of your details online. You can, um, you know, just you do have to show your face to the local grocery store or whatever. So there, I, I think there must there must be ways around this. There is so much e-commerce. To, so to suggest that they're peculiarly sensitive about providing their details for this type of e-commerce. Well, I think that's a, that's a bit of a uh, yeah, a bit of a nonsense. So let's let's find a technological way around it. I'm sure there is one, but the main that that ought not to obscure the fact that this is being pumped at children at a developmental age, which is really sensitive and where children should not be exposed to this sort of thing. So uh, what are we going to prioritise? And uh, I'm, I'm more inclined to put effort into protecting children than to facilitating the viewing preferences of adults. Uh, so what would be a, a better approach, maybe, if I follow what you're saying, is that uh, rather than having to put your a, a verif identity verification in online, you say that they all uh, adult services online, they, they, they can only accept some form of, of crypto currency or, or, or chips, like as, as they do in gambling, which can be purchased with a, a valid ID at a, at a certain place. Like for example, a cigarettes and, and alcohol, obviously you have to prove you're of age to, to buy those, but every uh, liquor and cigarette purchase is not tracked back to a particular person. Again, it's not foolproof. There's fake IDs, uh, some, uh, 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 some uh, retailers are, are lax in, in in verifying, but that's a a middle ground there, which still facilitates, say, a identity protection, privacy, relative adult freedom, but still protecting minors, like we do with cigarettes and alcohol. Yes. Gambling. Yep, absolutely, and particularly. Well, we've really changed the cigarette culture since I was um, a teenager. You know, it was very common for people to smoke when I was growing up at school. You know, regardless of, of the laws, you could still get cigarettes. But one of the things that has really changed is um, that, I mean, smoking cigarettes is no longer glamorous. It's no longer um, promoted in the culture. In fact, all you see now is these poor persecuted smokers who huddle behind dumpsters in the rain, you know, <laughs> having, having their furtive little cigarette. And, and I think that although, uh, you know, I, I feel for those people and I, you know, I, I, you know, I'm, I'm not, uh, you know, it's obviously harder for people to smoke. But on the other hand, the upside for culture is is great. And there, there are a lot of children now who are not pressured to smoke or are not, it's, it's not considered the done thing. There's, there isn't that sort of normalcy about it. And I think that we can certainly do the same thing about pornography. And to say, no, no, it's actually not a good idea to sexualize people or to dehumanize them or to objectify, sexually objectify other people. I think that's a bad idea. And I, we can certainly change culture that way. Uh, now, also the, uh, going on to the uh, consent matter again, obviously, uh, when you're talking about those, those men who... Uh, strangled those those women thinking that they they want it uh, there was obviously not that uh there, there was not really consent there uh, you you could say and there's been a lot of talk about uh, uh this uh, uh, about reforming sexual consent laws and uh th there's a proposal in in new south wales to have affirmative uh consent laws and they also a uh, want to restructure their uh, sex education uh, program to to talk about uh, such issues. In your opinion, is there a domestic violence epidemic and and do we live in a rape culture? Because it's quite a, a fractured social cultural debate at the moment and it's definitely not a, a left-right issue. Oh, there are so many different aspects of that. Do we live in a rape culture? I, my, my concern about the consent thing, I, I, I actually think it, the, the consent, the ideas that, of New South Wales to have con, to change laws around consent are, um, are, are dangerous for young men 
And um, if I were a young man at the moment, my advice, you know, my advice to young men would be don't, uh, you know, be, be careful, be very careful out there who you have sex with. So it's really taken the spontaneity out of everything, hasn't it? And all of the things that the feminists said that they wanted 20 years ago, which was sexual liberation. Well, you know, I was joking with a colleague of mine and saying, well, what does a what does a contract look like? Does it look a bit like a marriage contract? You know, are we not approaching a new form of Puritanism here? Um, where, so, okay, there are lots of different things that you could say. I think that culture has really exposed women to um, an unprecedented level of pressure and um, sexual attention, which may be quite unwelcome. So I completely understand the toxicity of the culture. Are um, men or young men to blame for that? Absolutely not. Should we distinguish between um, lewd jokes and actual predatory sexual intentions? And yes, and I think that some of the studies that say we live in a rape culture have been very um, blunt about, you know, they, they, they haven't really um, distinguished between lighthearted joking you know, there, there's, it's one yeah, thing well, to well, say. I was, I was mentioning about locker room talk uh, before. Yeah. Obviously, that can, that can be quite explicit, but it it uh, necessarily doesn't imply disrespect. And it's not that women don't do that as well, you know. <laughs> so, I mean, not not in quite the same way. And and I do I do um, understand that men might be slightly more driven in that way than women, but 30% of porn viewers are now women as well. So those uh, those distinctions are blurring. Um, so I do think it's necessary to distinguish between um, not, not every instance in which a woman feels um, preyed upon, is, is that legitimate? So, you know, yes, did you feel offended? Do you feel that he was being um, invasive? you might feel that. Was it reasonable to feel that? That's a separate question. And, and really, I think we need to look at the objective standards therefore, because um, if we encourage women to feel like victims all the time, then you'll find a lot of, you know, I suppose all I'm trying to say is a lot of the response that, that you get will depend on the question that you ask. And um, are women right to feel a lot more preyed upon than than they were in, our, in my day? And I, I really can't answer that. But I'm, I'm, I'm pretty sure that, well, I, I don't know. I, I wouldn't say that sexual culture has changed that much in terms of what um, men and women say to each other or about each other. And I certainly sort of miss the days of the 80s when people could be a bit more open and a bit more relaxed about certain things, I suppose. So there is a sort of neo-Puritanism. On the other hand, I do think that there is a great deal to be said for having strong boundaries about these um, around sexual relations and what is and what isn't expected or accepted, acceptable. So sometimes you get um, a mismatch of expectations, I suppose. And in my day, it certainly wasn't expected that women would be up for sex 24 seven. So, and so I think that might be something that needs to be reset in the culture. I think I've wandered away from your question, but uh, yeah, perhaps you can remind me where we where we were headed with this. Well, it, was a, it was a good answer, and I certainly uh, agree that uh, for for one woman, a a man might be charming; for another woman, uh, she might perceive him as a show, chauvinistic. And uh, so, obviously, there 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 are subjective and objective uh, standards here and certainly there's there's nothing wrong with 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 uh, a good traditional sex or, or 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 smart smart sex it's just these say modern or to use the current term mutations which are, are of alarm uh, but uh, just going back to this uh, report uh, that uh, Andrew Andrew Wallace uh, the, the Liberal MP uh, tabled also wanted to look at the links between uh, pornography and, and domestic violence. Do you believe that there, there are any? Oh. Yeah, sure. Just before we leave the other subject, one of the things that I would say that I'm concerned about with the New South Wales law is that it seems to reverse the onus of guilt so that men are guilty of rape unless they can prove otherwise. And that's a problem. How do you prove a negative? So... I think that sets a, an alarming precedent. Um, I would, I would 
be fearful for all the young men um, under those circumstances. So, and and I also think it will have a an inhibiting effect on relationships between men and women. And quite a lot of women might find that they don't like that. So, is there a link between domestic violence and? I mean, domestic violence is a very broad category and one of the, um, you know, the Our Watch mantra that says that gender is the driver of domestic violence is not true. Uh, they footnote to a UN report, uh, check their footnotes, and, and one of their submissions to the Victorian Parliament footnoted to a UN report, which I looked at, which also said that gender was not the driver of domestic violence. Domestic violence is a very complex issue. The big drivers of domestic violence, and they were this UN report was looking at places like Bangladesh and rural China and Sri Lanka, which I'm not sure are comparable to Australia. But one of the things that they were saying were that the big drivers of domestic violence are unemployment, drug abuse, a, a history of uh, domestic violence in the home. So domestic violence is a broad category. You get um, all, all, all sorts of different domestic violence. The, the type of domestic violence that is strongly gendered is intimate partner terrorism, and that's a very narrow part of domestic violence, but it's a very severe one. That is um, almost always male psychopaths who are terrorising their female partners. Um, how is that linked to pornography? And uh, again, I think you're, you're dealing with multiple moving parts here, so yeah. you can't just sort of draw strict causation. I think if you're if you're talking about sexual domestic violence, then possibly, or coercion. But those things are terribly hard to measure because particularly within established relationships, where is healthy exploration? Where is consent? You know, th th those, are, those are very difficult things to measure empirically. So um, although, although I would say that there have been studies, I'm just remembering back to my report, that say that there have been a lot more... Um, sexual domestic violence uh, crimes being reported and particularly in unlikely categories geriatrics for example and you know people being tied up and terrorized so yes I think there is a link how simplistically you can you know draw cause and effect well that would that require a lot more um, in, investigative work yeah, because uh, domestic violence broadly, it's about one partner's controlling abusive behaviour. It's it's it, the, the 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 old uh, mantra of, of why do why do they stay? It's often that they can't escape because this other person you talk you talked about in, intimate partner terrorism is because they've made that person so uh, the other person dependent on them that they just feel that they they, they can't leave and often a lot of the time that's nothing to do with sex or, or it, 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 it can't, it's not it, it's more a personality disorder rather than trace back to a particular uh, to pornography for example yeah that's right i think it would be hard to prove single factor causation although pornography might exacerbate the situation it might add to a you know a sexual dimension to violence which otherwise might have taken a different form so yes absolutely but also domestic violence and this is one of the things that often gets forgotten but you really need a typology of domestic violence so intimate partner terrorism is one aspect of it but there are other aspects which are much more gender equal which is basically where people get drunk at the weekends and beat each other up and there are a lot of different factors in in that and, and you can't just um, draw gender lines quite so neatly in those sorts of situations now uh, there's not just uh, a, a explicit the explicit pornography industry there's also the our uh, hyper sexualized uh, popular culture uh, which can contribute to uh, sexual uh, dysfunction so you were talking about uh, uh, billboards uh, before uh, social media is incredibly poor when it comes to a taking down pornographic uh, content, even child pornographic uh, content. Uh, they, they take down so-called hate speech uh, particularly uh, quickly, but not actual harmful uh, imagery, not, well, not just sex, but also videos of uh, people being killed and, and that sort of, that sort of yeah. stuff. Yeah. Uh, you're talking about women's health uh, before. There's, there's all these lifestyle... Uh, websites that promote a, a hypersexualized culture and the, the mainstream media, uh, the news uh, uh, from 
uh, time to time doesn't like uh, mixing a bit, uh, mixing in a, a a bit of sex for to to, to get uh, eyeballs and well for radio listeners as well. Yeah, absolutely, because sex sells, and I think when people when you have a culture that's much more saturated in sexual imagery and sexual concepts, then you have to try harder to get someone's attention, which means that obviously um, pornography feeds into marketing more generally. Yeah, so that that's a, that's another issue. And I think these things just snowball and there's no natural endpoint. That's one of the things that came out of the research. Where does this finish? Because as you were saying, there's all these fetishes. You can, you can go off into all these dark corners. But one of the end goals of the sexual revolution is to normalise everything, um, that erotic responses to, you know, frogs or feet or, you know, w whatever, violence in particular, um, that that those things become normalised. And, and, oh, and technology only exacerbates the problem, of course, because broadband is one thing, but then we have smartphones. So you can take porn wherever you go, and this means that children can access it. And it also means that people who want to stop have a really hard time doing so because it's like being an alcoholic and working in a in a bottle shop you know it's always there at your fingers if you've you've um, got a computer and you work in an office or if you're um, you know at home locked down in covid it's it's always right there at your fingertips and really hard to um, to resist I suppose so um, now of course they have virtual reality technology coming on board I don't know whether you're aware of this but you can put goggles on and have various things attached to various parts of your body that stimulate you while you're watching a um, simulated game. And they're having serious um, worries about the health of people who, you know, you put your goggles on and you are Hercules. You've got this amazing bod and a six pack. And, uh, you know, half an hour later, you take the goggles off and you realize you're still the, you know, same greasy overweight guy with chisels under your nails that you were half an hour ago and you're not that great and so that's the sort of come down from I, I was this you know this godlike creature to actual reality is is rather a stumbling block for people but um the the whole immersion in the physical experience and I think this is one of the things that we really don't understand enough is what this does to your brain because you are invited into this fantasy world and fantasy and reality merge and become indistinguishable. And this is where um, watching pornography probably does feed a rape culture. They, they did some studies on it in America and they um, basically <laughs> sat people down and made them watch a lot of hardcore porn. And then they were um, interviewing them about um, rape fantasies and this sort of thing. And they had to stop the study because they realized that it was not ethical to continue the chances of one of these men going home from one of these sessions and raping somebody on the way was quite significant. So um, it's the blurring of fantasy and reality that happens in pornography um, that I think is is really um, uh, detrimental. And one of the one of the aspects that I found fascinating but really disturbing from the research. I, I've also seen uh, several. Uh, it, documentary segments about uh, in in Japan, uh, young men can have basically sort of Tamagotchi style girlfriends. They, they can have a virtual girlfriend on sort of a a, a Nintendo uh, Nintendo screen and uh, it's AI and, and interacts with them like they're, they're an actual real girl to uh, talking to them. Mm. And uh, uh, this is part of a broader, a cultural problem in 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 japan with or just young people self-isolating yeah and it's the same with with companion dolls or sex dolls as well but uh you know you've got a compliant woman who only thinks of you and and i was when i first heard about ai and these these companion dolls i was saying but surely that's going to be dissatisfying this is really quite a funny conversation actually because i said surely you'd get sick of someone that just agreed with you all the time. <laughs> Don't you want someone to argue back sometimes? And, um, and there was, you know, the answer was no. There are, there are a lot of men that are just very happy with someone who tells them what the weather will be like and, you know, is, is placid. And, uh, but ultimately, and this is, this is my objection to all of this, is that it disconnects sex from 
human intimacy and human connection and I think that's something that feeds our souls and so we've really taken all of the feelings all of the human connection sex is an amazing wonderful thing and we should be treating it with a lot more respect than we are do you believe that the the sexual revolution that mainly kicked into gear in the the 1960s and has been turbocharging there has it has it peaked or is there or could, could it still degenerate further do you see a a turning point in sight yeah it, it hasn't peaked it hasn't reached its objective so in order to understand the objective objectives of the sexual revolution you have to go back to the father of the sexual revolution who was alfred kinsey who wrote um sexual behavior of the human male in 1948 and sexual behavior of the human female in 1953 and these are the books that sparked the sexual revolution. And his approach to sex is very materialistic. So he's basically saying, well, we can't distinguish between uh, different forms of sex. You know, some orgasms are better than others. So we're, all we're going to do is we're going to measure orgasms. And orgasms are morally equal in his view because all we're looking at is the physiological response. So we're divorcing um, the physiological response from any sort of emotional or human context so when he's talking about orgasms he's not he could be talking or sexual contact sorry that was the word we're going to measure sexual contact and he doesn't tell you whether it was rape or consensual or anything really about it all he's saying is we're just going to go out and measure the data and so what he says is it's actually when you look at sex when you boil it all down to just an orgasm and an orgasm is just a physiological response well, then it's impossible to make moral distinctions between different kinds of orgasm, isn't it? Because it's just like digestion is a natural human capacity. So why would you distinguish between people, make moral distinctions between people on the basis of what kind of food they like to eat or, you know, their choice in food? Well, you wouldn't do that, would you? And he says basically the what comes when it comes down to sex, what you're dealing with is really why people make different choices and you can't judge their choices. So on this basis, and this is and one of the other supposedly groundbreaking things that uh, Kinsey discovered is that children are capable of orgasm from birth. Now, I won't go into the gruesome details, but it's, it's wrong and it's horrific. And the more you look at it, the more of a, of a, of a oh, anyway, when, when I first realized what I was reading in the National Library, I was looking at his books and I realized what I was reading and I wanted to throw up. He is looking at clinically itemizing symptoms of extreme distress in small children and confidently asserting that these are symptoms of pleasure and orgasm. So children crying, struggling to get away, fainting, passing out, striking, you know, it's, it's horrible, the list. And, and of course, Kinsey was a sadomasochist, so he's not capable of distinguishing between pleasure and pain. So what he's doing is he's looking at these children in extreme distress and confidently telling the gullible audience that this was symptomatic of sexual pleasure and that the children definitely enjoyed it. So on this horrible foundation has been built a huge edifice, which is that children are sexual from birth. And if children are sexual from birth, well, then we ought to be able to facilitate that, um, that sexual exploration. And a lot of people who believe Kinsey's flawed theory have built sexual... Um, education programs based on, on these, these premises. So there's, there's a lot of different consequences that come from Kinsey. Sexual education is, is, um, is one of them, but pornography is another because Hugh Hefner, who really launched, relaunched commercial pornography in America, um, declared that he would be Kinsey's pamphleteer. So really what he was doing was translating Kinsey from academic discourse into popular culture. And that was what he did. And, and I think that we can see, you know, 70 years on from Kinsey, the uh, pernicious effects of what he was doing. And you, you, these uh, sexual uh, education uh, programs that, uh, that have been implemented in Australia uh, and their, their offshoots such as safe schools and uh, respectful relationships, you would have noticed reading those that they have what's the Kinsey, Kinsey-esque uh, philosophies inserted into them oh absolutely um so after kinsey the, the kinsey institute left one part of its library empty although the, the 
reimagining of sex education was very clearly premised in Kinsey's introduction. You know, on the basis of my stunning discoveries, we're going to have to re-look at, at sex education for young people. But they didn't address that issue immediately. It was taken over by a group called SECUS, the Sex Information Exchange, oh, I can't even, Sex Something Education Council of the US. And that was headed up by a woman called Mary Calderoni, who had previously been um, a director of Planned Parenthood. She took over SECUS and SECUS was launched from the Kinsey Institute and it was partially funded by Playboy Money. Because what is SECUS doing? Well, it's encouraging children to explore their sexual capacities. And what is that doing? Well, that's creating a future market for Playboy, isn't it? So these synergies uh, are, all, are all there. And um, Mary Calderoni's husband, Frank Calderoni, was very influential in the early days of the World Health Organization. UNESCO is now um, promulgating comprehensive sexuality education programs, which are supposed to be age appropriate. But if you look into that, you'll be shocked at what they think is age appropriate and what we should be teaching children all around the world at different ages. And of course, it's premised on the idea that children are sexual from birth and therefore that their liberation, their sexual liberation is necessary. Now, this then gave rise to a whole um, group of uh, academic pedophile advocates who were very convinced that parents who were protective of their children were abusive, were actually limiting their child's capacity. And that, and this was one of the things that I found very shocking when I started reading pedophile apologetics, is that you walk into an inverted moral universe where the goodies and the baddies have changed places. So the protective parents are now horribly abusive and the wonderful heroic people who just love the children and are gonna liberate them into this marvelous self-discovery well, those are the pedophiles, right? So when you hear the words abusive parent, you really need to be careful who you're listening to because the sexual revolution has not reached its objective because its objective is the complete deregulation of all sexual behaviour. Because one of the things that's very important in Kinsey's work is the complete lack of recognition that sexual behaviour ever causes trauma. So... Children are not traumatised by sex. No, no. What, what are they traumatised by? They're traumatised by the fact that their parents overreact and tell them that something traumatic has happened. And, you know, when I was working at the ACL, this is quite funny, but you get all sorts of people ringing you up. And there was one man, quite nutty, but um, but I learned a lot from him because he had grown up in the 60s, was obviously a complete, a complete devotee of Kinsey and had imbibed all of this stuff. And he uh, was telling me that women who were raped are not traumatized by the rape. They're traumatized because they have been set up by culture to believe that those experiences will be traumatic. So this tells you a lot about how these people are thinking. So I then had the question, because if you look back at the 70s and the 80s, uh, they were a lot more um, open about advocating for pedophilia back then. It was, it was kind of chic, it was cool, it was a bit sort of, you know, the left wing were liberal about these things and, oh, you know, we're going to lower the age of consent here and be, you know, accepting about our pedophile buddies. You know, the culture was really very different. It wasn't nearly as prudish as it is now about pedophilia. I think it's a good thing that it's prudish about pedophilia. Yeah. I think we've got a narrow window of opportunity um, because already you can see that they're trying to um, erode that shock. But why did we have the reversal? I was really confused, you know. You look at the 70s and the 80s and we were just chugging towards acceptance of pedophilia. So what was it that happened? And a friend of mine uh, sent me the article and said, no, no, I, I, I read about this. And it was actually the Catholic abuse scandal that changed the culture. And this was really interesting because the progressives on the, on the left, who basically then as now had control of the media to a large extent, they were quite accepting of, of you know, sexual liberation in general, but they also really hated the Catholics. So there was a kind of war. Did we love the pedophiles more than we hated the Catholics? And yeah, it turned out they hated the Catholics more. So so they ended up, in particularly in America, exposing the Catholic sex abuse scandal. Very good thing that they did. My goodness, what was going on? Oof. So um, the result was that these grown men, these images of grown men breaking down and crying were published by the media and they were imprinted on the national consciousness, particularly in America, but not in Europe. So in Europe, the culture is still very different, which is why Roman Polanski has managed to find an accepting audience in Europe. He's found safe harbour there. 
he won't be accepted in America because the culture there changed and it changed because of the, the exposure of the Catholic sex abuse scandal. But now we have the problem because people think that pedophilia is just a Catholic phenomenon. And they, you know, they've managed to isolate it and demonize the, the Catholics. And uh, I think the Catholics took one for the team. But until we realize that pedophilia is a widespread phenomenon, and if anything, it's becoming worse, precisely because sexual interests are being cultivated in men who otherwise would not normally be interested in children. Um, so, so it's it's becoming more of a problem, and it's more widespread through culture. And at the same time. The Catholic, the pedophile lobby are still at work trying to say, oh, we need to be kind to pedophiles. They're born that way. No, this is a this is a great myth that uh, that pedophiles are born that way and they can't help it. Or that there's a thing called virtuous pedophiles who don't abuse children and just really love them. Well, if you if you read their narratives critically, they are lying their heads off. And it's it's but but of course they're playing they're, they're playing on our emotions. Oh, you need to look at me and poor little victim me instead of looking at the children and what they would do to them. So, yeah. I, I do have faith that the Kinsey revolution will never reach that horrific climax because, as, as, as you said, the, the uh, disgust and, and contempt uh, for uh, pedophiles is growing in, in society. There is uh, it, children are uh, encouraged these days to, to come forward uh, if they are abused in back in like 50, 50 years ago, particularly with the Catholic Church, they were they were not uh, not believed. Uh, there, more uh, more people think that uh, the the punishment for pedophiles should be worse, the the the, the death penalty. And and of course, there 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 are the uh, the activists. They're they're ne they're never going to uh, shut up. But uh, certainly the that the, uh, the 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 wider society their their contempt and disgust and well you see the explosion in these uh, so-called uh, pedo hunter groups and and various things there there there's such a, a strong disgust to it um, I, I think it is the last frontier isn't it is is the protection of children because um that that's visceral like people are People will accept the sexualization of adult culture, but when people go after children, that's a that's a completely different matter. So, in some ways, it is the last frontier. But it, I wouldn't um, be complacent about the fact that they're not working very hard to um, to erode that last boundary. And one of the things that I find very disturbing, and and you really do see a a split between popular culture and the elites. So there are still a lot of elite advocates for pedophiles for pedophilia. Uh, they sometimes change their language. They talk about children's sexuality, for example. Or one of the other things that's happening is that through pornography, they're normalising um, sex between children or the sexual limit, minimising the, the trauma that comes from the sexual assault of children by other children, which is another um, aspect of pornography. One of the aspects of culture that changes is that you see a lot more... Um, children assaulting other children. Now, that's not a normal thing for children to do, but when they've been groomed, when they've been watching pornography, it's natural for children to um, repeat the behaviours that they've seen. So one of the things that I find very disturbing is that I've recently, and I only just put this together recently, the the APA, I think it's the American Psychiatric Society or Psychological Society, Psychological. It's the one that produces, well, there's two different societies. It's the one that produces the, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, has for the last two um, editions of the DSM has refused to include uh, clinical, clinically sound evidence that sexual abuse produces trauma in children. So this mm. research was done by um, a, a doctor called Van der Kolk. I can't remember his first name, but he's a well-regarded trauma. He was working with PTSD in um, returned soldiers and then re realised that there was a distinct type of PTSD that was produced from sexual abuse in children. So he mapped all of this. He got the diagnostical, uh, diagnostic criteria mapped out and treatments, and it was all set, ready to go in the DSM-4. DSM-4 came out, and there was no, none of this material was included in that. So then he went back to the APA and said, oh, I'm surprised that my material hasn't been included. And they said, oh, that was an oversight. It'll go in DSM-5. So DSM-5 came out 
still nothing from van der Kolk in there. And more than that, they then said, ah, oh, no, it's because we actually don't believe your evidence. There's no evidence to say that sexual abuse causes trauma in children. Now, the same DSM-5 had a, um, uh, a typo, that was what they called it afterwards, where they put pedophilia down as a, an orientation. And this caused outrage around the world, of course, and they, they said, oh, whoops, you know, butterfingers, we, we put that in as a mistake. We meant uh, interests, pedophilic interests, not pedophilic orientation. Now, the, it might seem like a, a bit of a semantic nicety, but in fact, it has huge implications because all around the world, we have um, discrimination legislation that prevents the discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation. So if pedophiles are suddenly an orientation, well, then you can't say that they can't work in your daycare centre, can you? Oh, no, no, because I'm a virtuous pedophile and I would never harm children. So this is, they're working both ends of this. They haven't given up. And it's, uh, and of course, the idea that it was a typo is absolutely absurd because there had been several conferences, including one in, yeah, in the... And they go through editing processes, several editing processes. Uh, it's hard to believe that a... A, a, a book of or a manual of, of such global importance could have such a typo. Yes, and more than that, you have people who are contributing to it who are in their private Twitter accounts advocating the rights of pedophiles. There are conferences leading up to this that are talking about, ah, oh, shouldn't we be lighter on pedophiles? And, of course, this is why they want to deny the trauma to children because they want to say it's not such a bad crime really. We don't really need to lock these men up for so long. Now, one of the things that I find really interesting, actually you might like to interview him, is a friend of mine who I've come across um, on social media called John Euler, and he worked with sex offenders in the prison system for 11 years. So he had previously worked with survivors of sexual trauma, and then he worked with the offenders. And one of the things that he would tell you is that pornography is a feature in every single case, every single case. There is, without exception, pornography is the common factor in the, all of their, their case files. And he wasn't just working with the guys in his own sex offender group that he was treating. He had access to the files of thousands of sex offenders across the state. Every single one had pornography in them. Yes, that doesn't surprise me uh, mm. as well. Well, it's we, we, we've had a... a I would say a, a thoughtful and I would say in-depth discussion about uh, it's obviously not front and centre all the time this uh, topic, uh, but it's it certainly uh, needs exploration, discussion, and uh, ways that we can uh, m make sure that uh, that sex overall uh, is is still a a good and it's damaging the, the 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 damaging side effects of it can be uh, can be mitigated yes no i well I, I just think we need to reclaim sexual culture and and say that no it is something special and it needs to be treated as special and it's private and it's between and one of the worries that i have about consensual you know education about consent is that one of the things i think we need to be educating children about is how to not consent how to have proper boundaries and um, also how to respect other people's boundaries and not to assume that just because something's on your mind that it's on someone else's mind as well. So um, thank you for the discussion, Tim. It's a really important subject that you brought up and thank you for having me on to talk about it. Uh, it, was a, it, was a uh, it was a pleasure. It was enjoyable. So uh, even though we did touch upon some well, uh, unpleasant things, but uh, yeah, it's it's stuff that needs to be uh, talked about and explored. So take care, and I look forward to to more of your research in all of your areas of expertise coming out. Thanks very much, Tim. Thank you. Thanks for tuning in to Wilmsfront. Visit timwilms.com or Rational Rise TV to view the archive of episodes. And keep visiting theunshackled.net to view all our shows and to keep up with the latest real news and analysis.